From Built It Productions, it's The Great Creators. Conversations about creativity with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. I'm Guy Raz, and on the show today, singer-songwriter Ray LaMontagne. I spend most of my time away from music. At some point, a melody will start to bother me, and if it bothers me enough, then it will lead me to the guitar, and I will grab some piece of melody or piece of lyric that's bugging me, and I'll record it into my phone or something really quick, and then go back to my life. Ray LaMontagne has released nine studio albums over the past 20 years, and he's primarily known for his beautiful, raspy folk rock sound and heartfelt lyrics. According to Esquire, his voice is as authoritative as James Earl Jones and as soulful as Al Green. Now, Ray rarely does interviews. He lets his Grammy-winning music speak for itself. But in this episode, he opens up about his amazing creative journey. You'll hear how he quit his career as a carpenter to pursue music, why he risked his whole future by standing behind his first album, Trouble, when the label asked him to rewrite all the songs, and why he almost never plays music in his daily life and only picks up a guitar when a melody enters his head. It's all coming up after this break. Ray LaMontagne lived a whole life before his career as a singer-songwriter. He worked as a shoemaker and a carpenter. He was married. He had two children, all before he produced his first major album. Ray was one of six children raised by a single mother in New Hampshire, and his father was a musician, but their relationship was difficult. Yeah, he was not there. He was uh, he was a big, angry guy, like my mom. He, they were both runaways. Uh, my mom ran away from home when she was 13. Um, I know my dad also ran away from home at a very young age as well. They were street kids, and he was... Uh, you know, of that generation. They're just they're tough. They're angry. <laughs> you know, he would... Uh, I have. I only have memories, you know. I, re- I, rem- I remember yeah. my mom coming home from the hospital with her face all bandaged up because he had broken her nose in a mm-hmm. fight. He punched her in the face like, a, like she was a man, you know. I remember watching... I remember sitting in the living room and watching TV cartoons Saturday morning. I was very little. I, I couldn't be five. And he came barging into the room and grabbed the TV, pulled it, uh, you know, off the wall, off the plug off the wall, and threw it straight through the living room window out into the driveway, smashed in the driveway. He got in the car and left. And I think he came back maybe a year later, briefly, for a minute. And then I didn't see him until I was like 20. I think I was one of my very first shows when I was like 28 years old. He, he, I wow. walked into a club in Nashville, and I heard a voice behind me say, you got your mother's fucking nose and my talent. And I turned around, and there he was, you know, this guy. And I recognized him, of course, from photographs. That's dad. And that was it. Was it the last time you saw him? Yeah, it's the last time I saw him. <sighs> I can't even imagine that 28 years old to... To... Oh, it was it was very bizarre, but I don't dwell on these things. I must say, no. <laughs> life is life is yeah. It's it's who I am, I guess. But um, it shapes you, um, absolutely shapes you. Ray, you were um, you have you had a bunch of siblings mm-hmm. growing up, and I wonder when you were a kid because I I know that you didn't really we'll get to this. You didn't really pick up guitar until you were like nineteen. But when you were a kid, did you sing? Did you walk around the house singing? Did you sing in the shower? Did you sing at all? I liked music. Um, I know I had a harmonica when I was really little because my father played harmonica, so there were harmonicas around. And I remember my mom gave me a harmonica at some point. Again, that's a, that's childhood memories. I don't I don't remember that much. Yeah. But we couldn't afford much. I mean, we didn't have like a stereo. By the time I got a guitar, like you say, it was I was in my 
probably 19 or 20, 21. And my mom actually bought me the guitar at a pawn shop. It was a Fender acoustic guitar, I remember. And it was like $15 or something. And that was huge. I mean, but until then, I, we, did, we didn't, we just didn't have that stuff. But did you know, and was there any indication, you know, we've, We've had hundreds of mm-hmm. guests on the show, right? And 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 from the mu- music side, you know, people like Jeff Tweedy mm-hmm. and Bjork, and and you know, I mean, all kinds of musicians, and and many of them, you know, played music as kids mm-hmm. or were in choirs or they somebody said to them, we just had Mark Foster on from Foster the People, and 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 when he was a kid, somebody said, "You're really talented. You should be in the Cleveland Orchestra," wow. and. And did at any point when you were 13, 14, 15, did somebody say to you or your mom, you know, I think Ray has something? Well, it was never like that. No, it was my mom was strangely really ill-equipped to be a parent. But at the same time, somehow she managed to teach me the core, um, really core values. I don't really know how she did this. But she somehow managed to do that. And she would get me, like I say, she got me my first harmonica. I remember the harmonica. Um, I remember her bringing a, a, a drum kit home that someone had set out on the side of the road, you know, for free. So it was missing all these parts. But I kind of set it up on other things to try to make a drum kit out of it. Um, I remember that briefly. I remember her saying things like, you're musically inclined you're also mechanically inclined. Mm-hmm. You know, as I got older, I remember her saying um, that I needed to have a trade <laughs> to fall back on if I wanted to um, do anything artistic. Again, these are things that she said. Right, looking back now, I would think, how did ma- my mother ever say even know to say that? Because she was so disconnected yeah. from being a parent somehow. I know you spent part of your te- you grew up in New England and spent part of your teenage years in Utah of all places and and I ha- yeah, Nebraska Tennessee and, and yeah. how how did you what kind of teenager were you I mean were you quiet on on your own were you bullied were you shy did you have friends did you I always had friends yes um, I was um, a hard kid for the teachers to pin down uh, we moved around all the yeah. time. Um, so it was a year to a year and a half in any school, and then we were out the door. We were somewhere else. So I, I didn't have a lot of time to settle in anywhere, and I had to continually go through that um, initial phase of, you know, where do I sit at lunch? <laughs> you know, who's going to kick me off the table because I don't, I'm not part of their crew or whatever? And lots of, um, lots of fights, lots of bullying. Yes, but again, my mother. In Nebraska, I remember very. I'll always remember this. There was there were these two brothers in Nebraska. I was probably, I had to be in fourth grade, third or fourth grade, and and I was the target. And the older brother would egg on his younger brother to to get me. So every day I had to go in, and this and the older brother would would sick his younger brother onto me. They were really tough kids. And, you know, one day, it was just another day, I came home and I said, I said something to my mom, like, I'm just, I'm not going to school tomorrow. I don't want to, you know, I just keep getting in fights. This kid just keeps hitting me. And she just sat me down and said, um, tomorrow when you go to school, if he bullies you again, if he punches you again, you just turn around and you, you hit him as hard as you possibly can right in the face. Don't ever let anybody bully you. And the next day, that's what happened. He did the same thing as ever. You know, they tripped me, they knocked me down or whatever. And I just hauled off and punched him in the face as hard as I could. And then I probably got my ass kicked. But it was that cycle, you know, everywhere we moved, it was, you, you had, I had to learn to stand up for myself because I was a small kid too, you know, it was a, um, you know, skinny kid. From, from what I read, you did pursue a trade. I mean, initially you went back to New England where you're from, you went to Maine mm-hmm. and worked at a shoe factory. And and I guess this is like, because we're around the same age, so I know the time frame. And the, the a story I hear, which is, might be apocryphal or not, is like 
you hear Stephen Stills' song, Treetop Flyer, and it just triggers yes. something. And I'm and I, I want to hear this story, but I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in trying to figure out how that, you know, sort of inspired you to say, you know what, I want to do this. Because you were you were like 19 at that point. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of people might think, well, it's too late. I don't know how to play an instrument. Yeah, well, it that has been, that somehow that story has been condensed into this funny little myth of... Um, you know, I'm just working a, a factory job, and one day I hear Stephen Stills, and I quit my job, and immediately, you know, I'm signed to RCA. But this is not the case. And, and it, this is just this is what happens when you talk to you know one writer for the first time, and then the story just gets regurgitated and condensed and changed. I did work factory jobs right out of high school because I would, you know, I barely got out of high school. So this is like the early '90s, you basically, and you started in Maine. Yeah, right out of high school. Yeah. Yeah, in a um, in a shoe factory in Maine. Yeah, it was like temp work. You, know, sure. you get those temp jobs, and then it's mandatory overtime. And but my mom, you know, wanted me out. That's you know that's what I did. But it was just it was those kind of jobs, those menial labor jobs that you could get. But music was starting to creep in at that point. I was really starting to to uh, listen to music a lot. And it was everything. It, w once it started, it just snowballed, and it was just my escape. You know, like most people, music was just became this other world that I escaped into. And it was everything from Bob Dylan to Everly Brothers to, you know, Metallica, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, the band. Everything that I could get my hands on, any, anything with a melody, anything that was transportive, I just started to live in that world. Whenever I could, you know. You just started listening to whatever. Just listening. And it was purely just just like any other, you know, kid who was listening to music and really getting into it. I just found that it was such an escape, this other world I could go into. Uh, just just sorry to interrupt, uh, but, uh, but on that, that idea, who, I mean, you mentioned some musicians, but tell me a little bit more about who you were listening to and, and why you think... You connect. I mean, you might not be able to explain this. Sometimes it's just in. It's it's inexplicable why we connect with certain sounds and voices. But do you have a sense of why you are connecting with Stephen Stills or Van Morrison or or, or or anyone that you were listening to? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I just love mm. melody and I love um, voices. You know. Like you listen to the Everly Brothers, you listen to Nat Cole, Sam Cooke, uh, Ray Charles. I mean, oh, I mean, Ray yeah. Charles, you know, Willie Nelson. They're, they're, they're very distinct. I guess all they all have that in common is that they're, um, those vo voices are so unique and beautiful. And then just songs, when I started to really listen to songs, like I say, that the storytelling and this transportive quality that they have, it, it just became my release. It was just a place I lived. I just lived in there. How did you discover music? I mean, you're in Lewiston, Maine. It's not, it's not a, a metropolis. It's not a tiny place, but it's a pretty small place. I've been there. And, you know, you, you grew up moving around and... and going from place to place. And, and, you know, sometimes it's like older siblings or it's a radio station or it's something like that. Yeah. You know, um, I was, um, I, I remember my younger sister, uh, Cody, bringing home uh, uh, Freewheel and mm. Bob Dylan and listening to that with me. And I had never heard Dylan before. And I remember that being a really big moment, you know, which... Um, if I'm not mistaken, led to Joni Mitchell again from my mm. little sister, Cody, who really loved Joni Mitchell. And um, once you start looking for that stuff, it leads you to the yeah. record store, right? And then when you're in the record store, there it is. It's like you're just flipping through the stacks and they're all right there, you know? And it just became this uh, sort of journey of uh, discovery, uh, discovering all these sounds and songwriters and music. It, it, and And if you got a record, right, like, Freewheel and Bob Dylan, which is I mean, what's on Blowing in the Wind, Masters of War, a Girl from North Country. I mean, mm -hmm. what are, I mean, it's unbelievable, right, to think about that record. Yeah, would you sing truly. along? Would you like 
sing along with Girl from North Country? Like in, I don't remember being. I don't remember doing that. Honestly, I really don't, guy. I don't remember that. It was all so gradual in my from my perspective. You know, I had this really awful guitar, and um, I started to learn chords. It was more about just learning mm -hmm. chords, really. You know, um, trying to learn how to play the guitar. It was it was really very gradual. I never had any aspirations. I can honestly tell you that I really I never had any aspirations. I just was drawn to it. And it's funny as we're talking about this. This is so strange because I don't think about yeah. this stuff anymore. It's like it's all such a the whole trip. Life has been such a journey, and it's so intertwined with being, you know. My relationship with my wife, who I've, who I've known since I was... This is Sarah, uh, who you guys got married when you were in your early 20s, I think. Yeah, I was 23. She was 24. So we were just kids. And the, it's all so intertwined and inseparable. It's, it's, um, and so gradual. When we, when we got married, it was just, we, I just knew that, you know, I wanted to spend my life with this person. And, and of course, we immediately, you know, my first son was born a year later, and then two years after that, my second boy was born. And so I'm working as a carpenter and, you know, trying to keep a roof over our heads and dealing with real life stuff. And in the meantime, I'm just starting to, you know, get a little better at playing the guitar. And um, and that's when, you know, at night after work, I, I just started to write songs. So you, you and Sarah, young couple young parents you've got you know really young although i guess sort of in the context of human history it's not that young right but now right. people have kids in their yeah. mid 30s and later um and you're trying to make a living as a carpenter and writing songs but here's the thing that i'm trying to figure out and we might not be able to figure this out you have a very very special voice right like whether it was a gift you were given or which it was, and something you, of course, developed and honed, but you had this thing, right? And so there are many really talented um, guitar players and songwriters, but but they don't have a voice, or no, or, or or they don't even know they do, or they may never discover. I don't know, you know. And and I wonder, mm -hmm. how did you start to understand that maybe you had something special? Was it Sarah? Did she? Would she say to you, you know? You you keep singing. I mean, what did you know? Did you feel like there was something about the way you could use your voice that was different? No, I really didn't. It was a very private thing. It was just I was doing it um, as an escape, as just like uh, you know. Again, it's sort of a, a just a very natural progression from you know, someone like Bob Dylan or Neil Young or Van Morrison kind of kicking the doors open into this other world that you can discover and um, immersing myself in it and then trying to write my own songs. I, I just, it's so hard because I don't remember ever thinking, oh, I want to try to do that. Yeah. I just kind of found myself doing it. As far as singing, it was really just grabbing stolen moments when no one was in the house. And then I would I would try to sing a little bit and I would try to hit a note and and figure out how to breathe to hit a note and but it was still it was all just a very private thing it was just me when no one else was around and I would try something and it just kind of very very slowly and gradually progressed until um the next step really was seeing live music I started to venture out and see some folky come through um in a coffee house or in something. In Lewiston, Maine? Not necessarily in Lewiston, no. But I know I saw Jonathan Edwards somewhere mm -hmm. really early on. But I knew that people were playing coffee houses and would maybe make like 20 bucks. Yeah. And that's actually what propelled me to try. I thought, if I make a recording of these songs that I've, that I've written, maybe I can get a gig. At, and if I sang, you know, if I had one of these little things on the weekend, it would be like gas money. So... It eventually got to that point where I recorded some songs and then just recorded it on like a like a home recording studio or yeah I, I went to a, a guy's house who had some stuff and I remember making a disc and 
and trying to get gigs with it. And I remember Sarah helping me try to get gigs, and it was just a miserable experience, and it just didn't happen. Were any of, any, any of those songs um, on that demo songs that you ever recorded and put on records? If if that is the case, I don't recall yeah. that either, because it's um, it's probably best to forget. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering, even before you got to that point, like... Having kids, I'm not. I'm not deliberately being vague. Oh, guy, I know. Honestly. I know. I know. I'm, I'm honestly. I'm honestly trying to cast my mind back, and I take everything very much day to day. And the whole, per, like, when I talk about it, with it's very hard to piece it all together because, like I say, there was no moment yeah. when I just thought, "Oh, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do this." It just did not happen that way for me. It was very gradual, and then, you know, at some point. I remember making another recording and that one was a little bit better. And then I tried again and was helped by a friend in Maine to, um, to play a festival, uh, like a two day festival. And he was running the whole show and he got me a, a slot where I could go and sing some songs. I, I mean, I, I may have played out three times before I played that gig. I never played on the street. This was in the late in the late nineties. Yeah, I never played on the street. I never did any of those things that people talk about doing, like sing, learning cover songs and all that. I never did any of that. Never learned other people's songs. I just wrote a handful of songs and started singing. Them. How did you feel about that? About sitting in front of people and doing that? Were you comfortable? It was probably the most terrifying thing I could imagine. Getting in front of people. In any kind of social situation where everyone is looking at you, you're the center of attention, is, was it, you know, I still don't do that really. I mean, I guess I do it for my living and I'm more comfortable in it now, but I wouldn't choose to do it unless I had to do it, you know. But back then, it was like the most terrifying thing in the world. Yeah. It was, it was absolutely terrifying. And so I would just turn everything inward. I would just all, every, all everything is from the inside. I would just go deep inside and do it. And I had no idea how to do it in the early days. We'll be right back with Ray LaMontagne after a quick break. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. Here's more from my conversation with singer-songwriter Ray LaMontagne. You were serious about building a career and supporting your family, but it was it was to become a carpenter, like a, a a timber framer eventually, I think, right? That was my dream. I really loved that um that style of building and I wanted to work with wood. I love to work with my hands. And yeah, that was I mean, I was really hoping that um I could get some kind of apprenticeship and pursue that. But it wasn't music. Music was just I mean, literally something that you could do for 20 bucks to pay for gas because it was it would be helpful well i was hoping yeah i was hoping but it never worked <laughs> it, it didn't work and you know P, it, nobody responded <laughs> and um it have you know i got a couple gigs and i think i got a meal out of it but that was it it just it no that was that was not happening it, it really wasn't until um i played that festival um, there's two days in festival. Sarah was trying to hawk CDs for me. And the festival was in, it was in Maine? It was in Maine, mm -hmm. yeah, Topsom, Maine. And Sarah was selling them. And that we didn't, sell, we didn't sell very many of those then. But then somebody at the very last uh, set of the weekend, someone came up and gave Sarah a tw $20 bill for a $10 disc. And um, he told her to keep the change. Which we thought was unbelievable. Like oh, we just, we were, just, our minds were blown by this. Mm. And then, um, you know, I had contact information on my on the disc or something. And it was like f six months later, we got a, a message from him saying that he had reconnected with a friend from college who was in the music business, and he asked me if he could send him that disc. He really liked. He wanted to send it to his friend. And of course, I just said sure. And um, you know, three, four, I don't even know how long. It was months after that, that guy from, from LA in the music business contacted me and, um, through his friend and got me on the phone. And, uh, that was sort of my entry into the music business. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's a reminder that fate, chance, 
maybe a plan are real, mm-hmm. you know, because your plan was to, and you you are a carpenter. I mean, you still do a lot of that that work. I know, but not not prof- well. I'm not very good. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't hone that that skill. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call myself a carpenter by mm-hmm. any stretch. No, I wouldn't. Uh, but but this I think happens mm-hmm. when you're like. 25. Yeah, right around 25, 26, yeah. It would still take a bunch of years before you actually, it actually materialized. Like, I think you went out oh, to yes. L.A., you sang some yeah. songs, and then you heard nothing. Yeah, I sang, yep, I went out and uh, I met this guy and um, went to L.A. and met his current boss and uh, sang a couple shows, uh, played a couple shows in a club, which I can't remember the name of, uh, in L.A., but and it was for it was for Hollywood Records, mm-hmm. which is some Disney label, if I'm not mistaken, and they had some interest in me, and I got such a bad feeling from them, hmm. a, a bad gut feeling from them. I didn't, I did, I, an innate sense of I don't trust, I don't like these vibes that they're giving me. I just there was something about them that made me feel they were very something that wasn't right, and so. When uh, Jamie called saying that this could progress to something that, you know, he thought a record deal was in the works or a, some kind of offer of a record deal, which again was just like, you know, I don't even, I can't even remember what I thought about it, honestly. All I knew was I didn't like those guys. So I told him, I don't like those guys. And he said, well, look, he said, Ray, you're crazy. They're, you know, they're going to offer you a record deal. You're going to turn that down? And I said, yes, I don't like those guys. And that was it. I said, no, we hung up. And again, it was another six, eight months after that. Mm. I just went back to my life, doing my thing, uh, working as a carpenter. We were living off the grid at that time in a little cabin I had built. Uh, we pulled our water up from an old farm well. And you had farm what, well. four-year-old? Two, two kids. How old yeah, were they? two boys. They were, I think Sebastian was, I think they were four and two. Wow. Or five and three, somewhere around there. We had our hands full for sure. Um, and again, this is off the grid in the woods hmm. on a piece of, um, I bought like 57 acres of, of logged land and built our, our cabin there. And we had no car. The car didn't, you know, it was, it was, it was rough. I got to tell you, it was rough. I mean, you know, if we had a car, it was like $200. And, you know, if we could keep it going, it was a miracle. It was, it was that. Anyway, that's where we were. Hmm. But. Like I say, you know, eight months goes by or something, and this guy calls me back, gets in touch with us again, and um, says he's working for someone else, and will I come back out and meet his new boss? And so I talked to Sarah, and she says, okay. So I flew out and met his new boss, and um, and this guy I liked. I liked him. He was a surly Scotsman, hmm. um, worked for Warner Chapel for years and years and years. And he was just, something about him I just liked. And I could tell he liked me. Um, I could tell he was tough and uh, worked hard. And I think he liked that about me. I think he felt like he was talking to someone who was willing to work. And I think he respected that. And I sensed that from him. Hmm. And he was also very open about the music business and how... Uh, criminally out of balance it is for the artist. <laughs> so he was just, I, was something about that honesty, uh, we kind of struck something up, a friendship, I think. In your mind, if you, and you may not be able to remember, because it, you know, it's, uh, memories are, 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 are tricky, but do you, do you remember thinking to yourself, this is what I'm going to do now? Or did you think to yourself, this is something I'm going to try, but really I need to focus on, on this other career because I've got to provide for my kids. I mean, we were, you know, we're, I've got to make a living. And so I'm going to focus on, on, you know, my carpentry. Well, that's very, that was very forefront in my mind at that point. Once I met, uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny McPherson, um, he wanted to help in some way. Mm. It was at that point when I could really sense that there was an opportunity I don't know what it would lead to, but I could sense that it was a, a true opportunity. It wasn't some pie in the sky thing. It was maybe, uh, maybe I would write songs and they could be used uh, for someone else. Someone else would take a song, and maybe that would pay a little bit. Right. And so that was my initial thought was um, because Kenny was with a publisher, so it was a publishing company. So I thought, okay, 
he likes my songs, and um, I, I did get the sense that they thought all of my songs were unfinished because I write in a very, I don't write in a, a typical way, especially in the early days. It was, you know, if a song fulfilled my emotional need, then it was done. And that's sort of the next phase. But that initial moment, I, I, I knew he felt, I could tell he was honest in his belief in me, mm. that I had something. And whether that was going to be, you're, maybe you can write songs for some artists and we'll, we'll shop your songs around. That was the absolute most I could hope for at that moment. So I took that back home and talked to Sarah and saying, look, you know, I can either uh, say no to this and, you know, keep trying for this thing, you know, try to get an apprenticeship with a timber framer, or I focus on this opportunity and, you know, maybe I sell a song. I didn't even know what that would mean. I had no concept of what that would mean. Yeah. But I thought maybe that was the next step. And so that's what, that's how I entered it. And that's how I was pursuing it was I'm going to go back out in the next visit and meet this guy that Kenny wants me to meet. And we'll do some songwriting together and make some demos, some proper demos. Yeah. So that was the first step. What happened was I go back out and I have dinner with Kenny and, and they introduce me to Ethan Johns, Glenn Johns son. And they want me to songwrite with Ethan. And that's when my, that's when another side of myself comes out because <laughs> the resistance that came up within me was so clear when it, when the mention of let's finish your songs, they're not finished. We need to do something with them. Oh, then immediately it was like, no, 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 no. My songs are my songs. <laughs> I write the way I write, and that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So that became very clear. There was, you know, there was some attempts at this, but it seemed strange to me. Something about it felt really wrong, and I was, um, I wasn't happy about that. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, because Sarah is like my best friend, she was the one I call, Sarah. They don't think any of these songs are finished. They want to change the songs. I can feel it. I don't like it. And she supported me. And she said, this, this is you. <laughs> so that was the first of this, much of this to come, yeah. this sort of uh, friction. And so I resisted that and wouldn't allow anyone to change songs. And then that was um, one of those moments where everything could have fallen apart at that moment. But instead of that happening, we got through that kind of rough patch Ethan and I and Kenny, and I, we just recorded the songs as I had written them. Um, and when I go back and listen to those songs now, that was what became trouble. Those, 20 those, years that's, ago. Yeah, yeah, 20 years those ago. Are, those are the demos we made, you know. When I listen to it now, which I just did because it's the anniversary, 20th mm -hmm. anniversary, I haven't listened to it forever. I mean forever. Forever, guy, <laughs> honestly. I, I was just shocked I just thought, because now my son, my oldest son, is as old as I was when I was making those records. Wow. And he seems like a child to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, he isn't, but, you know, I see the time. And I think I'm so proud of my younger self for having that sense of self, you know, that strong enough sense of self to know that a song like Burn or All the Wild Horses or Narrow Escape or Jolene or even Trouble, which is not shaped correctly as far as the music business is concerned. They don't have, you know, some don't have choruses, some have a bridge, but it doesn't go anywhere. Some have, you know, it just felt right to me. Yeah. I'm just so proud of my younger self for being strong enough in that such an alien situation to to stand firm against sort of that, you know, pushback I was getting, even though it was well intended. Yeah. I'm I'm curious about about that. I mean do you think, because, you know, here you are, a guy who's, you know, got two young kids and not a lot of money and an opportunity. No money. Right, an opportunity. <laughs> and you've got people in the business with a lot of experience saying, Ray, the, these are the songs you should record or this is how you should write them or this is how you should record them. And most people in that situation would, would say, okay, I'll do what they say because they're the experts and this is my shot. But But you said... I'm not going to do that. I, I want to do it this way. And and you did that at the risk of you being wrong and that album flopping as a result of that. And I, I like I guess you just didn't worry about that. You didn't you didn't worry about the 
you know. The no, I, I didn't because there was nothing in me that wanted it. Hmm. You see, yeah, <laughs> I didn't want it. I didn't. I had no idea what was going to happen. I, I really thought. It was just this very natural one step at a time, and I thought maybe someone will hear them, and then they'll want to record a song. But when it came right down to it, like I say, when it came down to the crunch of them wanting to maybe, you know, these aren't done, let's work with a songwriter, do this or that, I got there was a defensiveness that came up, you know, that shield came right up. And once that happens, I didn't even really have to say much. They could just see it. It's like, yeah. we're going nowhere down that path. So it wasn't like I was being a tough guy or brave or anything. It was just intuitive. Like, I don't, that doesn't feel right. I'm not doing that. So I had no idea. And it was only an opportunity that might lead to something. And instead of leading to whatever, someone using my songs, what it led to is, well, okay, these are the demos. And when they started to play them for other people, it became pretty clear that people weren't interested in taking that song to their artists, they liked what I was doing, mm. but it was what I was doing. It was my voice attached to the song, the way I was, the soul or whatever, the honesty that I was bringing to it. Because they are, when I listen to it now, it's, it, it's just like anything else I've ever done. I can hear it. It's real. There's not, there's no intent behind it. It's the, 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 the emotion is real and you can hear it and it's sharp and it's pointy mm. and it's not, sanded and soft and it's it's very ugh, it's almost uncomfortable but it's right there and that's what people responded to which led to the next challenge which is oh no one wants to sing your songs but they really like the way you're singing them do you want to come sing this thing or play this show or oh my god yeah and that was just like ugh. you know it was crazy there's a, a video of you performing at Austin City Limits in 2005, mm -hmm. so shortly after that record came out, and um, it's a wonderful performance. And I, you know, I, I, I know about you. I've been a fan of. I remember when that record came out in 2004. I remember hearing Trouble and thinking, "Wow, this is really special." You know, the, it, it, for somebody who, you know, and I love all kinds of music, but if you, you know, I love Tim Buckley, and 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 I loved. Nick Drake and I love you know, Otis Redding mm -hmm. and even even Joe Cocker. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are all kinds of elements that, and I was like, "What? Who is this?" You know, it was very special. How did you? Because you are so quiet, you are introverted. These are this is not criticism. These are this is an admiration. I'm saying this, and yet your voice and the resonance and the power of what comes out of you on stage is so clear. It's so. You know, I, I mean, th that, those are the words I'm using to describe it. And yet you are also, as a person, quiet, reserved. Tell me how you found, for lack of a better, you know, way to, to ask a question, how you kind of found your voice, found this voice that comes out of you. I think it just, I think it came from that, the push and pull of just that, that some deep part of myself needed to be expressed but it fights up against that part of myself that doesn't want to be the center of attention in any way. <laughs> so you see, it's so hard so it's, to be those two it's things. Extremely yeah. hard, and it's really, especially in the. I had to grow so much. Oh, it's yeah. It's hard to talk about um, because yeah. it's uh, it, music for me is like. Zen, like Zen Buddhist, Buddhism, is like there is no scripture to Zen Buddhism. The universe, the universe itself is the scripture. There's no written scripture. The universe is the scripture. And then mm -hmm. the Zen Buddhism as a whole is nothing less or more than the, the full acknowledgement of the infinite. Everything in every single moment of your life. <laughs> you can imagine trying to achieve that sense of awareness, like full awareness. I cannot imagine that. Mm. But music, when I'm writing, when I hear the melodies knocking and then I just know, oh, it's time. I have to get my guitar and find these melodies. I have to find it. It's like I have to learn to play the guitar every single time. Where is this melody? What is this thing? What's, what did it want to say? That's as close as I get to that feeling. So everything else falls away and I just live in this 
this sense of awareness and the songs mm. come to me and I try to find them and I let them tell me what they want to be and I help f bring them into the world, you know? That's how it feels to me. It's a very magical thing. Almost like they're they're like a, the, these independent organisms that are just channeling themselves to your body, the vessel of your body, and coming out into the it's, world. Yes, it's like I the way I, my relationship with it now is that it's your imagination, your creativity is a gentle spirit. It's like a child. Yeah, and you have to be very gentle with it. So if it comes to you with something in its hands. Let's say if a child comes to you with a drawing and says, this is a, an elephant, look, and you look at it as an adult and it looks, it's just lines and colors. You would never say to that child, this looks nothing like an elephant. What do you think you are, Van Gogh? Like, don't quit your day job, kid. <laughs> and like, chuck it, right? That's like my stepfather's voice. I'm, I'm mimicking him. Yeah. That's my step, that was my stepfather's voice. You think you can do this? You can't do this. Always, always, you can't, you can't, you can't. But you would never do that to a child, that you would say, no. oh, that's beautiful. And then you'd say, and, and, you know, what is he doing? And they would tell you what he's doing. That's what that part of me is. That's how I treat it, gently. So if it comes to me, whatever it wants to play, whatever it wants to do, that's what happens. So trying to reconcile that feeling of just pure creativity, imagination, you make something... Who, and then you have to then turn it into your living. It's just, it's really challenging because it means something to me that the act of doing it is the most important thing. The writing of it, the creating of it, the recording of it, the making it, bringing it into existence, that's what's the most important thing. And then it's a whole other skill and craft to then that I had to learn uh, to then yeah. bring it to people to make it live because that's where it lives is live music that's where it happens that's where the magic happens and that's a whole I mean we could talk for two hours about that learning curve you know yeah I mean I wonder because part of of the sort of the flip side and, and for many people this is a, a benefit but for, for many people this is challenging of quote unquote success is it's not just music that you are now performing or, or creating, you are performing and you are a public person. And part of that, the success of the music, with that comes other things that are not so fun, especially for somebody like you. And I wonder whether, I mean, that, that record really received a lot of attention, mm -hmm. you know, and then you received a lot of attention. And I wonder whether there were times where you thought, I don't want this. I just don't want this at all. I want to... I want to hit the off switch, the off button. Uh, I just yeah. wanted. Definitely. Yeah, of course. Because it um, it meant uh, that I had to be away, you know, from Sarah and the boys. And they were still really little. And all of that weight fell onto her. I mean, yeah, it just, it just created so much difficulty. Um, it was so hard to find a balance and to and to continue to support each other. Of course, she wants to support me and my creativity and and on this you know trip that's just one step at a time becoming something kind of that we didn't expect, you know. And uh, of course, I want to be supportive of her and the boys, but I know that if I don't invest myself in this, it will never happen. As far as like, will it get to a point where maybe we could? support ourselves you know we were still in that hmm. phase of not having any money and just with with each step it, it, it's like you get deeper in and you realize oh okay i'm really committing to trying to see if this is going to work as a career and i just wasn't it was all so wacky because i was i never thought of it that way i didn't think oh now i have to learn to stand in front of people and saying and yeah what how do you even do that i mean you know it was Really, <laughs> I learned. I learned on the you know in the act of doing it. I learned how to do it. I want to sort of digress for a moment from this timeline of your life and 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 ask you a bit about writing and your process of writing and what you. I mean, of course, a lot of what you write about is love, and and I'm assuming your own 
love story. But when you when you compose something or when you when you start working on music, first of all, do you have a specific discipline or process where you sit down and no matter what, you just write every day? Oh, no. <laughs> no. I spend most of my time away from music, my own. Like uh, my, my guitars go in the closet. Um, and what do you do? What do I you just, do during that time? I just live my life, you know. We're, we're a really close family and we, we just live you know, I um, do w w w work with wood. Do you read? Do you I do spend, hard labor? Well, I do love to read. Yes, and I um, and uh, I love to um, mess around with old cars. I've been known to build the occasional hot rod, so you know, <laughs> and uh, mess around with engine building. And it's really a passion of mine. I have a lot of fun with that, but I don't play music. Um, I don't play the guitar. And no, I absolutely don't write. Um, it's only at some point a melody will start to bother me and um, I'll be doing something else and a melody will start to bother me. And if it, if it bothers me enough, then it will lead me to the guitar and I will grab some hmm. piece of melody or piece of lyric that's bugging me and I'll record it into my phone or something really quick and then go back to my life. And... And then mm -hmm. the next thing will start to bother me and bug me, and I'll think, oh, God, this is just not going to go away. So I just go and I'll record some little thing. But at a certain point, and it always happens, it's usually winter because I can't be outside doing something. It'll, it just becomes like a, a, a nonstop. Like it just, I just know it's time to get the guitar and to try to see what these melodies want to be. What, which, who wants to live and who doesn't want to live? And I'll start to listen to the things and, you know, the melodies will grab me. And if one grabs me, then I just follow it. And that's it. So it's fragmentary. It's like pieces here and there. And then eventually over time, something that might start to look like the rough outlines of a record start to shape up. And that could take a few um, years. That's actually not right either. It's more of, it's it's like melodies, like I said, they, they bug me. And then I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll get them down. <laughs> But then what happens is when it comes to that point, it's like I know that I'm going to make time for it. And so I just set everything else aside and I just give myself to that. So I open myself up to it. And those little fragments may become nothing, but one of them will open the door. So that first one that grabs me and actually, you know, can follow it to completion will then open the door and then other stuff comes in that's not intended and then the songs start to happen. Very rarely anything I was working on previously. It's just that the, the door opens and then I become in that place, I, I get in that place and I stay there and, and that's when things start to come through. Stay with us. We'll have more with Ray LaMontagne right after this break. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. Here's more of my conversation with folk singer Ray LaMontagne. So I read that, that after... God willing, after that record came out, you, you basically stopped writing. And from what I understand, from what I, you've said, you were just really self-critical. You, you had a hard time doing things that you felt were good enough. And, and I wonder, and this is, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of people struggle with this. I struggle with this. Um, it's getting a little easier as I get older, you know, as I get into my 50s. But I still, there are still days mm -hmm. where I tell myself, you're just, you know, you suck today or it, less so, but I still have them. And I wonder if you feel like that kind of self-criticism is is easier to kind of squash and cast aside now that you get as you get older. Yes, you should. You should. Guy, you need you need to you need to get rid of that voice has no place in your head. You, you yeah. have to know that. And it's just just make the decision. First of all, that that guy, whoever that guy is, wherever that voice comes from, whoever, you know, for me, it was definitely my stepfather. I, I know that. That guy has no room in, in my life. 
So it's gone, yeah. and I don't know where that where that voice of yours is coming from. It has a root somewhere, but whoever it is, they have, they have no place in your life. That's plain and simple. Just get rid of it. Yeah. Don't let them in. It's done. The door is closed. It's not coming in. It's over. So in that moment for me was after that record, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I just felt like all I was hearing was negative, 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 negative internal voice. Um, and it was it was just killing me. Mm. And I had to take some time. I I thought I was just done. I thought I can't do it anymore. And it was a couple of years before I wrote another song. I remember being at the we went to the ocean with the boys, and I remember sitting on the on the beach looking at the ocean and watching the boys play, and they were just so happy, <laughs> and so <laughs> happy being you know twelve and you know, 14 or whatever. And um, I just, I remember having a moment where I just thought life is so good and the boys are so wonderful. And I'm so fortunate to have this real solid foundation of, of uh, Sarah and the boys. And something about that changed the way I was feeling. And it led me to that realization that 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 negative voice just has no place in my life anymore it's over whatever mm. you know all the years of performing up until then i felt like was some kind of exorcism i had to get this these this baggage all this stuff out but uh driving myself by a negative voice saying you're not good enough you need to work harder you need to perform better you need to sing better you need to at whatever it was it just wasn't working all it was doing was making me feel worse and exhausted yeah. and um it just was self-perpetuating it just became i needed that negative voice to come in in order to get the fire to go play and it was just so wrong and it took me a while to figure it out like i say but once i did everything changed about performing now i've gotten to the point where it's all about just being relaxed as relaxed as you can possibly mm. be and be in the moment, be very present in the moment, and accept the good energy that the audience is giving you and use that and feed off of it. Before I rejected it, it was like there was a shield in front of me and I couldn't feel anything yeah. that was coming back. It was all internal, I was feeding off my own fuel. Once I figured out how to open up and relax and just accept, then that circle, I could actually feel that circle that happens where you perform and they get something from it and they give you back something and then you perform a song and they get something from it and they give you back something. And then all of a sudden it wasn't exhausting anymore and it was a more joyful thing. It was like this, you know, they're happy. Something about what I'm doing is making them happy and they're giving it mm. back to me. So you need to accept that, you know, and use that for fuel rather than pushing yourself, you know, driving yourself. And what, I mean, what was it that uh, allowed you to start to think like that? Was there something that you experienced or uh, just kind of a practice or a meditation or just, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious. Do you I think it was just taking that much time from not doing it. And then yeah. when I went back to letting the melodies come in and picking up the guitar again and just realizing how grateful I am when a song comes, how it makes me feel, like honestly, how it makes me feel, all criticism aside, no more, you know, this isn't, what, what kind of a song is this? What, and this is right before, this is the batch of songs I wrote for Supernova, you see? Mm -hmm. So that was what came after that. And when I hear yeah. Supernova, I hear play. That's play. And it's so different from everything you've done up until that point. It's so right. different. And that's the, that's, that's the inner, my inner child, that creativity, that honest child's creativity. Mm. That's, those are the kind of songs that I would reject, you see, because that's <laughs> not visceral enough. That isn't whatever. There's something, yeah. oh, that's not what, you know, there's not enough pain in this. There's not enough whatever. I wasn't doing it intentionally, but that's what that critical voice does. It's like something had to be visceral and painful about it or it wasn't getting through. And that critical voice was hampering me. And <laughs> after that, I feel I can just see it. And I remember my little sister calling me after that record came out and saying, this record sounds like the Ray I know. 
this sounds huh. like you. This is you, like my brother, you. <laughs> you know, she could hear that. Um, she could hear the playfulness in it, the real me. You know. Yeah. And I hear that when I listen to those songs. Of course, it wasn't really. Re I don't think it was. People didn't react well to it at all. But that actually helped in a weird way. <laughs> somehow because i knew i was on the right track i felt like yeah you're on the right track i know it's weird it's almost like a mind game you play with yourself somehow to take something negative and then twist it around someone says this is horrible yeah this doesn't sound like ray and but in but i know the truth actually this does sound like ray this yeah. sounds more like ray than than you know till the sun turns black sounds like ray so it just gave me strength to then you know, it was another hurdle. No one likes this. Uh, people were fighting at shows, yelling at each other. It was a mess. But but I knew I was on the right track. It's interesting. I mean, I, I can see how people would say this is not a Ray LaMontagne album, Supernova. But at the same time, it, it's clear that you let go and you allowed yourself to do, to really push boundaries that would lead to your next record, which was um, from what I've read, you were listening to like Talk Talk, mm -hmm. Spirit of Eden, maybe Laughing Stock, yeah. incredible records. Totally. Just, you know, life just can't imagine what, what Mark Hollis, mm -hmm. how he did those records. It's just, it's it's almost like Brian Wilson making pet sounds. It's just so, yeah, so good. You know, everything I've read about those, those recordings, like they would bring in, you know, um, you know, choirs of kids and then record for four days and then it would cut. It's cut kind of out, crazy. You know? It's a little crazy. It's a little crazy yeah. and and a little bit claustrophobic. I, I feel a little claustrophobic when I hear them, but I also hear the genius in them. There's something, yeah. it's a very, yeah, it's, it's. But it inspired you to create this kind of concept. I mean, this, you know, in, in the subsequent mm -hmm. record, I think it's, is it pronounced Ouroboros? Yeah, Ouroboros, yeah. Which is a beautiful record, and that's and 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 people compare you to Pink Floyd, not just Van Morrison and right. Tim Buckley and Otis Redding. It's like oh, and Pink Floyd, and I can hear that. Yeah, I can too, for sure. It's for me. It was more about again, and I just have to stress this. I know that um, when I started writing for that record, whatever it was going to be, I again, I, I honestly, I had no idea. I wasn't trying for anything in any of my records, really. I'm not really trying. I'm just listening. And then um, I try to then learn the song that I'm hearing, really. So it, it seemed, at first, it seemed incoherent. I couldn't quite figure out. I, I, it was a very puzzling batch of melodies and tunes. And at some point, it became clear what it was. It just became clear that... Every, each song somehow was just leading into the next one, into the next one, into the next one. And I, when it became clear to me, I really had presented it um, as one song. It was just one 45-minute song, to, in my mind. Mm. Anyway, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, genius or anything. It just, that's kind of what it felt like to me. It felt like it was just one long sort of song cycle, um, which I embraced. I thought, wow, this is really beautiful and somehow it really works mm. like one thing just flows into the next into the next so naturally and it just feels like it's all one thing and so when i yeah. was um, talking to jim about collaborating on it that's what i referenced was talk talk and it was just kind of a complete coincidence that he had just gotten a reissue you know a, like a 45 or something a new pressing of, of that same um batch of records totally fluke i had no idea but he understood immediately. And so I sent him the demo and then he wrote back, just release the demo, it's awesome. And I was like, no, <laughs> there's, you know, there's something else in here. There's textures in here that we need to you know, discover, we need to find. But that's an album that is a real high point for me. I, when when mm. I hear that, there's, there's something about that just such a gift from the creative yeah. whatever energy that creative energy wherever that comes from it's such a beautiful recording and i'm um i'm so proud of us for all working together so fluidly to to get what was in my imagination into reality you know i want to ask you about your new record long way home which is now out and it's um it's a terrific record long way home in particular um just a beautiful song Thank you. which 
I guess, I mean, from what I gather, you, like many songwriters, you first start with a melody and then you begin to kind of piece together words to that melody. Is that more or less correct? Um, more or less. Uh, um, a lot of times for me, a lyric, a lyric attaches itself to a melody to begin with. Um, not a full lyric, but some something will attach itself to it, and that's where it, it all grows from there, some seed. But Long Way Home wasn't like that. Long Way Home was, was not a, um, a melody that I had bouncing around or anything. I was, you know, in the midst of recording things and, again, just kind of in that zone where I felt connected. And I was just feeling a specific mood, and that's where So Damned Blue came from, this little instrumental thing, mm. which I recorded immediately as soon as, you know, it appeared. So it was very just fresh. Recorded that. And as soon as I stopped recording it, I was still sitting there with the guitar, messing with it, and it immediately led to the beginning of Long Way Home. And hmm. that song happened in maybe an hour. I mean, maybe an hour, start to finish, the whole thing. And as soon as it was written, wow. I recorded it immediately. So both of those pieces happened in the same night, and neither of them were planned in any way. Um, I was just strumming the guitar because I was feeling just the way that song makes me feel. I was just feeling a little, just deep in it somehow, and just expressed exactly how I was feeling, those chords and that progression. And it just led magically to that song, which, again, is just one of those moments where that song to me is just, regardless of how people, what people think of it, in the writing of it, it's just such a gift. It's no, there's no plan. It just is a Peter Pears, yeah. and there it is. And you're like, where? Do, who are you? Where did you come from? And then I see where it all comes from. It's this, you know, amalgamation of these childhood days that I had in Nebraska and in Tennessee, and um, walking home from school and filling up my pockets with pecan nuts because they're all over the, you know, all over the road walking home <laughs> from school. So I would fill my pockets up with them. You know, just those summer days when I was a kid, because like you, we're both the same age, so I think, or close to, so we were right on that edge where before, you know, cell yeah. phones and computers and connect, connect. So lucky. So lucky. So lucky. And I've, I am only now fully realizing that gift, how lucky I was yes. to be just on the edge of that and have that childhood where you could go to school get your ass kicked or beat someone else up and, you know, battle through it. But then when you, when you got home, you were done. It was, you were disconnected. Yeah. The rest of the day was yours. The weekend was yours. The summer was yours. And you could just lose yourself in this, in being a kid. You know, it doesn't last forever, man. As you know, you become an adult and it all comes in and, you know, reality, you know, life is heavy. So, what a gift that is, you know, to have had that that childhood where you could turn that stuff off. Um, you weren't constantly connected. Kids today, I feel for them so much. Not Me too. being able to leave those pressures. It's constant. I can't even imagine how how they do it, you know. If I couldn't turn it off as a kid, I, I don't know if I could have made it. I mean... It's heavy what what kids have to deal with. So that's where it comes from, you know. It's just that's what that song is for me. It's just that that gratefulness that I wasn't even really aware of until the song appeared, and then I'm yeah. like, oh my god, of course, that's what this is, you know. I mean, would would you? I mean, do you think it's it's fair to say that elements of this record are kind of not just a reflection, but kind of taking stock of where you are at this oh, point sure. in your life? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on for sure in my in my myself these days. I mean, um like I wouldn't change a thing. It's very literal. Yeah. It's right. Yeah. Yeah. Some songs are not so oblique. <laughs> Some are very yeah. straightforward and I love that. I always love it when a nice straightforward sentiment comes to me. I enjoy that kind of a song. And and you are producing your own music now, right? I mean, mainly you are independently recording mm -hmm. and producing. Yeah, it. and um, it's much better for I mean, me. Even learning Pro Tools. Yeah, it's like... crazy for me because I just can't stand computer time. <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, 
it just works really well for me. I found that pr working with producers, as well intentioned as they are, it's just friction. It adds friction to the creative process, and and then you may work with someone who just is, you know, I don't really want to get into it because I, f I feel like people will take maybe take it the wrong way. That I'm being judgmental, but yeah. it's just personalities, and some producers have a lot of pride attached to their role. And then there's also a level of ego that's involved, which can be just off the charts. And it's just, for me, it's more about collaboration. I just wanna collaborate with other musicians. I just wanna get some guys in the room and say, man, I'm hearing this thing, but I can't figure out how to get it. It's this sound. And just be able to bounce ideas off people. It should be fun and fluid and easy and uh, communication and not you know, friction and butting heads and you throw out an idea and someone says, that's not interesting enough for me. That's a very common phrase for producers to use. That's not interesting enough for me. And it just makes me live it. <laughs> it just makes me live yeah. it. It's such a crazy statement. It's a, that's a statement coming from ego. That's not, when you're bouncing ideas off with friends and, and other musicians, no one says that in real life. This is some kind of construct of I'm in a role that is more, I'm a, I am smarter and more creative than everyone in the room. And so you, you need my guidance or else you wouldn't be here. But this just, it's, it doesn't work with me. It's not copacetic. It leads me to just be getting, and yeah. then I get angry and things get weird and energy gets strange and, um, and then creativity is quelled and, then it's a, a, this sort of arm wrestling match to just try to get what's in your imagination on, on a record, and it's crazy. How have you managed to do all this on your own terms? I mean, make the music that you want to make, make the records you want to make, but not really play the game. I mean, you don't, you know, there's almost no, pic I've, I've never seen a picture of you like on a red carpet, for example. <laughs> No, or um, I mean, to really, I mean, it's almost like you have content, not contempt is the right word, but you, maybe that is the right word, but you've just very consciously, deliberately managed to not do any of the things that seem like you have to do to succeed. Well, you don't have to do them. That's the thing. If you're willing to take the repercussions of that. So if someone says, we've got the cover of this songwriting magazine you got to do a photo shoot next week and you say you know what i don't want to do a photo shoot they make me uncomfortable i have no control <laughs> they don't uh let me help choose a photo uh yeah. i don't want to do that you're gonna miss a huge opportunity this is a great opportunity well you know it's just, it's just a personal decision it's like okay so i'm not going to get the press that i would have gotten i get it that's a good look as they say a good look and I get it, I understand. That's furthering your career possibly or giving you a better, you know, it gets the word out more. But I would say, I say no to those things. I just did it recently, <laughs> just like within the last two weeks because I don't like, I don't like the fact that in order to do that, you have to play by their rules as if they're doing you a favor. See, that irks me. So it makes me, it, it brings out the scrapper in me. I've worked really hard to build my career, really, really hard. Nothing's been given to me. I've had to earn every single thing. Now, yes. when someone says, we want to do this thing, blah, 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 it's a photo shoot. And I say, well, if I can use a guy that I like, which is easy, very professional, this certain guy, I really like him, I trust him, and we'll give you six exclusive photos. But we're, he and I are going to take them and then we'll choose them and I'll give them to you. And if that's not reasonable, which it never is, they say, no, we need to own the photos, we choose, blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, I won't do it. And it's fine. But the thing, what I'm trying to say is, I'm willing to take the repercussions of that, which means I'm going to have to now work harder to get the word out. I get it. And I've done it my whole career. I have to work harder because I'm not going to the right places where you get your photo taken in social situations with Grammy parties, this and that, and everyone sees you and you're constantly, you know, in the mix. Um, it makes it, it just makes it harder for me. God, I guess what I'm trying to say. It just makes me have to yeah. work harder 
to try to get the word out, which basically means get the music into the world, get out there and play it and bring it to them and then try to bring people in to what you're doing. And that's, that. If I hope that answers your question, that that's basically it. And I've just done, that's just the way I've done it. Um, if it, if it makes me feel uncomfortable or I feel like someone's manipulating me in some way, I, I just, I say no. And it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, to some people that sounds like a, a not a great trade off, but clearly you've been able to live the life you've wanted to live on your terms without, and, and there might be quote unquote opportunities that you don't have, but it, it, it sounds like that they're not ones you want anyway. Well, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't want to make, um, I wouldn't want to introduce chasing fame into my life. Yeah. I understand that some people feed off of that and it works for them because that's their, you know, that's what they want to do. They enjoy it. They enjoy that part of it. It's almost like this, their, it, it, their whole world revolves around that, but it's, it works for them. And that's, I'm not being critical. It's just, you know, but it doesn't work for me. I don't want to spend my life trying to, as someone once told me, I need to get my face out there more. <laughs> Someone told me once, I had to get my face out there more, and that being famous was about making other people want to be you. So fame is making other people, creating a perception that makes other people want to live your life, to think, to be envious of your life. That's fame. And yeah. that's just gross to me. That's so gross. <laughs> And and I'm again, please don't take me wrong. I'm not being critical of someone who say who just lives for that world, whatever. That's their game, and that's their maybe it's creative to them in some way. I don't know, but to me, it seems vacuous and gross and empty. And I don't want to spend my life trying to be more famous. <laughs> I'd rather be in the garage building a hot rod or <laughs> playing with cars or something. I'd rather just be peaceful and content and happy and not, you know. And it also comes back to just some advice I got really early on from someone who said, other people's opinion of you is none of your business, which is yeah. brilliant. It's such a wonderful lesson. It's so simple, but it's so true. What other people think of me or, or what I do or my creativity or just me as a person, whatever, it's none of my business. People are so ready to take offense today. It's almost as if they want to. And I think that just that expression, take offense, you have to accept someone's offensive remark as if it was a toxic gift or something. You have to accept it to be offended by it. So why not simply just not accept that? You don't have to take offense yeah. at everything. People can say really mean things about you and you don't have to be offended by it in the least. You can just ignore it. It's not that hard. Yeah. It actually really, it actually becomes a habit and then it's really powerful, you know. Ray LaMontagne, thank you. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Well, thank you very much, Guy. That singer-songwriter Ray LaMontagne, his latest album, Long Way Home, is out now. You can find links to listen to it on our show notes page at thegreatcreators.com slash LaMontagne. And if you want to hear more interviews with musicians like Natalie Merchant, Ben Gibbard, and Jewel, just scroll down in your podcast feed or visit thegreatcreators.com slash episodes. Thanks so much for listening to our show this week. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to hit the follow button on your podcast app so you never miss a new episode. This episode was produced and edited by Kevin Leahy. Thanks also to Malia Agudelo and Kayla Rosenbaum. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to The Great Creators from Built It Productions. 